Excellent. All right. Welcome everyone to another SDE session. Uh, today's session is going to be one in our digital strategy area, and we're going to be talking about bringing digital analytics to the store. My name is, I am with Search Discovery. I will be playing the role that is often played by Adam Greco today, uh, working behind the scenes to answer any questions and moderate the Q&A. For those of you who are new to the SDEC, we are a free educational community that offers weekly educational sessions related to digital marketing and digital analytics. I will be putting some information in the chat. If you're not already a member, you can join for free. And if you join, some of the benefits are being notified ahead of, ahead of time of sessions like this, as well as being able to access our SDEC the Slack group where we have many, many, many recordings of past SDEC sessions. If you can during the session, please use the Zoom Q&A for sessions for our speaker. Uh, Gary, if you have any technical questions or if you have any questions related to anything about the SDEC, you can just ping myself or the SDEC um, uh, host on the chat. But for questions related to the topic itself, uh, please use the, the Zoom Q&A that will uh, help us kind of feed Gary the questions uh, once he's gotten through the presentation. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to my friend and a guy I have followed and admired for many, many years, Gary Angel. So Gary, welcome and thanks for presenting. Uh, thanks so much. Yeah, let's let's dive right in. We have 30 minutes basically to cover a topic that I feel like and probably have talked for days on <laughs> a time or another, um, all about bringing behavioral analytics to the physical world. And, you know, I changed the title a little bit because when I first uh, titled this, it was bringing digital analytics to the physical world. And I realized that in one sense that made no sense at all, because uh, we're not bringing digital analytics to a physical world. We're bringing behavioral analytics to the physical world, the same kind of behavioral analytics that we do in the digital realm. So uh, I've really broken this presentation up into three major pieces, each one of which I hope is going to be about 10 minutes long, and that's going to keep me honest as we go through this. The first section is a little bit of background about why it's important to measure physical spaces. In one sense, I hope this is preaching to the choir to this group. I expect most people that are listening to this are deep into measurement and kind of assume that uh, measuring things is the right thing to do. Oddly enough, in the retail world, dealing with people who run stores, I often find myself in a somewhat evangelical role having to convince people that this is something that we need to do, which harkens back really to the earliest stage of digital analytics when I had to do the same kind of thing with websites. Uh, but nevertheless, I think it's important to talk a little bit about this. Um, and I'll emphasize a little bit about why I think it's uh, especially important maybe around stores and some of the opportunities in stores uh, for digital analytics. The second part of the presentation is going to be a deeper dive into the technologies that we use to actually do measurement. Technology is important. It really sets the table for all the analytics that you can do. It certainly took us a number of years actually to really get up to speed on the technologies for doing measurement. As, as most analysts have learned, if you don't understand the underlying technologies that are collecting data, it can be really challenging to make sense of the data and understand all the data quality problems. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the technology. And then the third part of the presentation, I'm actually gonna show you some stuff. I have a couple, uh, I just went into uh, our application. I did a couple uh, movie screenshots of me actually going around and doing sort of basic analysis. So I'm gonna run through those and actually talk a little bit about how it works. So let's dive right in and talk a little bit about why you measure. And it starts with the idea that, hey, stores are expensive. Um, you put a lot of money into building a physical store and hey, it's expensive to build websites too these days. But the truth is, you, know, you can bring up a decent WordPress website for like 50 bucks these days, but you can't bring up a physical store for that. A lot of money goes into making a store. And these days, a lot of our clients are building out really fancy, really high concept, really large stores. And you got to ask yourself, what's the point of trying out a whole bunch of new experience strategies, bringing a whole bunch of digital stuff into the stores, doing all these fancy merchandising and display if nobody knows what worked or how to make it work better. And that's just a fundamental thing about measurement. What it really tells you is, what's working and what could be better. Um, you know, if you step back for a second and you think about your experience in a store, it's really a whole succession of micro experiences. The same is true on a website, right? A website is almost a page by page kind of experience, 
But in a sense, a website usually has more cohesion than the physical experience of a store. From a store perspective, there's sort of the entry going into the store. What does that feel like? What's the impressions you get? Um, the second part of the store is like all the merchandising. Stores are stocked with displays, you know, shelves and tables and areas. And as you go through those things, what you're really supposed to be doing from the store's perspective is engaging with product. Getting your hands on product is what the store is all about. And that's a unique set of experiences that are critically important to the store's function. You know, associates are a big deal in stores. Um, a lot of times we don't think about this from a website perspective. Maybe websites have chat, but by and large, um, Websites are fully digital. Stores aren't that way. When we go into a store, a lot of times we need help. Sometimes we don't want help. Um, but either way, what the associates are doing is really fundamentally important to a store. And being able to measure that is a really big deal. You know, associates in a lot of ways are the single biggest variable cost in a store. They're also the biggest competitive advantage that stores have, that ability to have good person-to-person -person interactions is a huge driver of success and brand. So being able to measure that is super important. And then lastly, I don't know about you guys, but waiting in line is something I really hate to do. I'm very impatient. Uh, you know, if the last thing I experience in a store is a long wait in line, it really puts a damper on the whole experience. Uh, we often find ourselves measuring queues and queue times. It's a really important part of the store experience. And optimizing the line experience is one thing that almost every store can do to make sure that it's delivering better customer experience. And then lastly, I'll just kind of put a bow around this. Hey, you know, there's all these little experiences, but they kind of add up. And part of what a store is trying to do is make you feel good about the whole experience. Every store these days is competing, not just with other stores, but with digital experiences that have really gotten good at making that experience feel crisp, clean, and easy. So, um, so that's why you made, you want to understand all those little experiences and that overall customer journey. The really cool thing is that these days, it is possible to measure every step of the shopper journey, to really understand how every part of that journey unfolded from the door, through the floor, to the checkout, across the way. You can really measure every single one of these things, and you can measure them in substantial detail. And I think that's pretty cool. So you can measure, of course, how many people are coming into your store, what the occupancy is, what the density is, when you get busy and when you don't. You can measure every single display experience, where people stopped, where they looked, where they spent time, what part of a display they were focused on. All of that stuff is measurable. And you can measure how long people stand, stood in line, how long did it take them at register? Did any people come to the register line and then abandon? That's super important to know. You can really measure every aspect of their entire journey. And I really think that's cool, but it isn't just cool. It's powerful. It's powerful in a way because what it lets you do is really understand how the store is working, what's working in the store, what isn't, and run continuous tests to figure out what you can do better, and then take the results of that to drive fleet-wide change. One thing that's a little different between the physical measurement that we typically do and the digital measurement that people do on websites is that usually with a website, you measure the whole thing. Everybody, it's a single website. Everybody in the world, or maybe everybody in the United States will get the same website. But with stores, you might have hundreds or even thousands of different stores. Each one of those is unique and different, but it's really expensive to measure all of them. It's not like dropping a tag onto a page and getting universal coverage. So we often find that with store measurement, you measure a small subset of stores that are meant to be representative and you extract the learnings and apply them fleet wide. So it's a little bit different from that perspective. You know, one thing that's always important when you tackle measurement is, hey, what questions do you have and what can you really answer? Um, I just put down a sampling of questions here, the kinds of things that we get asked pretty routinely. Sometimes these are so, so basic. And you know, if you're coming out of the digital world where you're used to having so much information about how, how a website is operating and what gets used and the flow and what kind of visitors you have, it can be a shock to realize that even some of the most sophisticated retailers in the world cannot answer basic questions like, which sections of the store get the most usage? Hey, they know what gets sold the most, but in terms of what the browsing behaviors are in the store, a lot of times they have no friggin' idea. Where do shoppers spend time? You know, if you put experiences in the store, how often do they get used and when do they get used? Do they drive, display, and purchase? You know, if you have experiences, how do they interact with the rest of the store? What display and merchandising configurations actually optimize engagement? If you browse in one section, where else are you likely to browse? You know, stars is the shopper to 
true associate ratio. And one question we get asked a lot is, do I have enough associates? And are they in the right places in the store to really help people? And are there times of day when there are too many shoppers for the number of associates or too many associates for the number of shoppers? Because all of those things mean money left on the table or costs that you didn't have to have. So these are the kinds of questions that you can answer if you have really good measurement. And of course, and I think this is one thing we've all really learned in digital is that analytics is not a standalone activity. You don't build stuff, build reports, and then just hope that, that somehow change happens. You have to get in a process of controlled experimentation I think that this process of experimentation is really natural for the stores. It really works well. One cool thing about stores, and I think it's even better here than in the digital world, is there's so many testing opportunities. There's so many things that you can be constantly changing and tweaking and improving, and it's actually pretty easy to do. And if you have the measurement in place to see which of those changes work and which don't, you get into that process of continuous improvement that I think all of us know really well and really believe in. So that's the why you measure. You measure to make stores better. It's just that simple. And because stores are important, the measurement is worthwhile. So that's part one. I'm largely on track from a time perspective. The second part of this presentation is to really talk about, well, what does it take to actually do this kind of measurement? I've said that you can measure every step that people take in the store, but what does that actually mean and how do you do it? Well, it turns out that there's a variety of technologies that you can actually use to measure shopper journeys in store. Um, none of these are perfect. Um, there isn't one be all and end all. You know, when I first started in digital analytics, we used web logs and then web logs gradually gave way to tagging. And now pretty much everybody who does website measurement, digital measurement uses tags. In the physical world, there's still at least four or maybe five different technologies that get used pretty routinely from, from a measurement perspective. One is cameras. These are like video cameras. They go up in the ceiling. They look down from the ceiling on people. Usually they have processors are on board. They're not shipping video up to the cloud because that's expensive and laborious. Usually what they're doing is identifying person objects moving through space. And then all they send up to the cloud is information about, hey, at Timestamp X at coordinate X, Y within the store, I saw a person. And then it just gives you frame by frame by frame. I saw a person here, then I saw that person there, and then I saw that person there. That's what measurement camera does. It's highly detailed. It's really accurate. Um, and, you know, it's almost exactly what you'd expect from, the from you know, if you imagine a video camera sitting up in the store, but with that video camera not being viewed by human eyes, but just being processed from a digital perspective. The second kind of data source, and I think we all know about this one, is smartphone phone and cell data. Hey, if you've got a smartphone app or cell, cell towers are often listening in on your phone, there can be data collected from that. And that data can be geolocated back to where the store is. Um, the nice thing about smartphone and cell data, if you take away the privacy considerations, is that it's pretty accurate. It's inexpensive and it's scalable across whole cities. This actually isn't the kind of data we use for the most part in stores. It's not positionally detailed enough um, to actually get at where people are relative to things like displays in the store. But I also happen to have some pretty significant privacy concerns about this kind of data. The third kind of data that gets used a lot is Wi-Fi and Bluetooth data. Wi-Fi data in particular was really popular when people first started. When I started Digital Mortar like four years back, Wi-Fi data is what we primarily use, but there's a lot of problems with it, starting with the fact that Wi-Fi data you know, you have to have Wi-Fi turned on, people using their less and less. Um, more and more uh, phones are, are randomizing the MAC address that they use when they're sending out Wi-Fi probes. So the percentage of the population that you're tracking is shrinking. Um, and we also found it was just really hard to get accurate geolocation information from Wi-Fi data. So we actually don't use it very much anymore. Bluetooth data, on the other hand, is something we use a fair amount, mostly for tracking associates and cards. So actually physical infrastructure and associates in the store and then recently we've begun using LiDAR. LiDAR is a lot like measurement camera. It's a different technology. It actually sends out pulses of light. It works in a wider range of environments, but the characteristics of what it does and how it measures things are actually pretty similar to measurement camera. To give you a little more detailed look at how this plays out, what I've done here is shown sort of the technical capabilities of camera, LiDAR, and electronic measurement. And I'm gonna start with positional accuracy. This, so this is, if you see an object, how well can you position it so you know exactly where it is? And positional accuracy is really important for analytics in the store. You know, in a typical retail store, um, in a mall, the distance between the men's jeans section and the women's jeans section, maybe a couple feet. 
Um, but it's really important to know which of those someone is shopping in. So you really need fine-grained positional accuracy. Camera delivers positional accuracy at about the one foot level, more than good enough for almost anything we wanna do. LiDAR can get that down to one to two inches. This doesn't really make that much difference. That's super precise. But the electronics that we use, it's usually more in the 10 to 20 foot range. That works okay in some environments like arenas and stadiums, but it's not so great in most retail, st in, in most retail stores. The second thing that you can think about from a measurement perspective is population capture. Are you measuring everybody? Well, camera and LIDAR pretty much do capture every person coming into the store. Um, they typically clock out at about 98 to 99% accuracy. In other words, if 100 people walk into the store, these technologies are gonna pick up 98 or 99 of them. Electronics these days usually comes in around 20 to 30%. That's not so good. And it's not a perfect sample either. Um, you're actually getting kind of a skewed sample. So with electronics, you're often getting a small subset of the population coming in. The third thing to be aware of is capture rate. How often are you getting a read on where somebody is? With camera and LIDAR, we typically set this to be every half second. You can actually do it finer. Obviously, with camera, you're doing like a 30 frame per second measurement. With LIDAR, it's very similar. Um, but we typically don't feel like we need that level of data. So we typically set this at about half a second. With electronics, you're getting a ping whenever the phone decides it wants to send out of ping. So it's more like 15 to 120 seconds, meaning you can miss significant parts of the shopper journey. So as you can see from this, when you consider these things, camera and LiDAR deliver a lot of very accurate information, electronics not so much. Um, on the other hand, electronics does have some advantages that cameras and LiDAR don't. One is electronics is cheap. Cheap is important. Uh, Retail is a very low margin business. Putting measurement in the store takes money. The cheaper you can make it, the better. A couple of truly nice things about electronics, other than just cost, is they can cover really, really large areas. You know, you can cover really, really giant areas with electronics, something you often can't do with camera and even LiDAR caps out at some point. And then the third thing about electronics is when you can track a phone, you can track that phone consistently over time and space. Um, and it makes it a lot easier to identify associates. In fact, electronics really excels at associate identification, something that I'll talk about a little bit in the next slide. Um, what about the differences between camera and LiDAR? Well, I mentioned that in a lot of ways, these are pretty similar technologies. They do a lot of the same things. And if you look at those top kind of core measurement capabilities, they're nearly identical. They don't really differentiate. LiDAR does have some advantages though, in its ability to cover really large spaces and a wider array of environments. Camera's very lighting insensitive. You know, you can't use camera except where you have good and consistent lighting. LiDAR is not dependent on lighting. So it makes it possible for you to measure in environments where the lighting has changed or the lighting is poor. Hey, you can put LiDAR up in total darkness and it will still work. Um, so LiDAR opens up some outdoor applications, some low light app applications, and some ability to track in really large spaces. Um, so from the perspective of a functional perspective, okay, if I have measurement, what does that mean? Well, Camera and LiDAR are the bellwether technologies that we use for most measurement. We use them for full population reporting. We use them if we wanna do merchandising and display tracking. We use them if we wanna do like intra area tracking from store area to store area. We use them if we wanna do things like occupancy management and queue management. Those are the core applications for what we do. We also use camera for full journey tracking in the store, but that's a place where we also start to use electronics as well. A couple things that we use electronics for on a pretty routine basis. One, if we want to do repeat visitor tracking. And I have a question on the thing about privacy, and we'll talk about that. Um, maybe at the end of the section, I'll talk a little bit about privacy and insert that before we get to the formal Q&A. Um, but one nice thing about electronics is electronics can potentially track people over time. Cameras cannot do that. Cameras are not collecting biometrics. They're not collecting facial images. They're not collecting any imagery at all. Um, as soon as you step outside of the field of view of a camera, that camera loses track of a person. If a person steps in outside of a field of view of a camera and steps back in, they're a new person, a totally new person. They are not recognized. The way we do full journey tracking with camera and LIDAR is by matrixing the camera so that each has an overlapping field of view. As a shopper travels from one camera to the next, the overlapping field of view is used to knit that shopper together. There are no biometrics and no facial recognition in this technology. 
That's great from a privacy standpoint. It has some drawbacks from a measurement optimization standpoint. So just be aware that from a data privacy standpoint, there's no imagery being collected. There's no PII being collected off either camera or LIDAR. There's no video being shipped up to the cloud. There's no opt out because there's literally no way for anyone to opt out. You don't know who anybody is and there's no way to attach any person's image to who they are. So from a privacy standpoint, these technologies tell a really good story. From a data join and integration standpoint, that can be kind of a problem. The last thing, and this is a place where we routinely use uh, electronics is for associate tracking. Why do we use electronics for associate tracking? Well, what we can do with associates is we can have them carry a small Bluetooth pinger. The pinger actually pings out every half second or second, thereby solving that frame rate problem that electronics has. And it allows us to do really inexpensive Bluetooth measurement on a consistent MAC address. Um, those little pingers are inexpensive. They cost like $10 for a little tag that an associate can carry. The tag will last for like two years of time. So by issuing each associate a little, a little carry card or key clip um, that has a Bluetooth pinger on it, we can get really good associate tracking and we can do that very inexpensively. And that allows us to distinguish between associates and shoppers. So um, the main place we use electronics these days is actually actually in associate tracking, not shopper tracking. And that's because we have the ability to actually assign devices to people. Okay, so that's a bit of an introduction to how this electronics works. How does this look in terms of the store? Well, most stores out there already have door counting cameras. If you walk into a store these days, if you look up, chances are you're gonna see a camera there and that camera is counting how many people come into the store. The first thing we typically add is cameras at key merchandising areas. So these are measuring just sort of the, the most important merchandising areas of the store. You can add a few of those or you can add a bunch of them and you can take that kind of to the limit um, by you know, covering the entire store. We almost always also add sensors, and these are typically cameras or LIDAR, at the queues um, so that we can actually measure queue times and lines because that's a really important area of the store. And if we're being ambitious about the measurement, we will use LIDAR or full journey camera. So we literally blank at the store with camera. So we're covering every step of the shopper journey. This is the best kind of measurement. This gives you that detailed flow throughout the entire store. And then lastly, we'll supplement that with that Bluetooth measurement so that we can differentiate between associates and shoppers and do really detailed associate measurements. So that's the technology that underpins the measurement. And that's what it looks like to get measurement into the store. It's kind of bulky. It's kind of expensive. You know, this isn't as cheap as dropping tags on a website. That's probably the biggest drawback that I've seen to physical measurement of the stores is that the actual measurement infrastructure is bulkier and more expensive to get in place. Okay. Um, We've covered off in about a little, I'm slightly over time. Hopefully I'll be able to make that up in this last 10 minute stretch. But that's a little bit about the technologies that underlie this and what it takes to actually do measurement in the store. So take a brief pause here, get a quick drink. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how this actually works and give you a little taste of how this shopper analytics works. And I think from the perspective of most people who have done digital analytics, this is gonna be pretty familiar. Um, I have a little video here. This is actually me just going through and capturing stuff. And actually, hold on, I'm not intending just to play this video. I'm gonna stop, pause it, and annotate it as we go through here. So I wanna start here. This is called the layout view um, in our application. And it's different than what most people are used to with a website because for a store, the physical layout of the store is a profoundly important fact. You know, understanding how the store lays out is absolutely essential from a measurement perspective. I used to tell people who measured websites, hey, you really have to understand the website. You have to go out and look at the site. If you're going to do measurement on it, you have to understand how the pieces fit together and what, how the navigation plays out. But that's even more true in the store. And the question that I started with for this was, hey, where do people, this is actually a question we get a lot. Where do people go when they come into the store? So this particular store has a couple main entries. It has a mall entry over here that leads to the mall foyer. And it has the main entry down here, which is to an outside parking lot and a main foyer. I've stripped away all the information about the store. It doesn't matter what date, the, what dates this is or what store this is. But the idea is I want to know for each of these entries, how many people go this way? How many people go this way? And how many people go this way? And the same thing here, how many people go to walk nine? 
nine? How many people go to walk 10? How many people go to walk 11? How many people go to walk one? That's what I want to understand. This is a question we actually get on a pretty routine basis because from a retail perspective, it's actually pretty interesting to know. You know, as they do setups on the store, they want to understand whether the most common pathways for people coming in is to break right, break left, or go right down the center of the store. So that's the question we're going to answer here. The layout view takes the store, puts it on a digital map, and then allows you to pick any metric and take a look at it and say, okay, how much did people do this? So before there, I was looking at foot traffic. But to answer this question, where do people go? I need more than just to understand foot traffic. I need directional findings. So this is a path analysis. So what I've done is gone into the path tool. This ought to be pretty familiar to anyone coming out of digital analytics. But there's a little bit of a trick here. Um, from the understanding the people who uh, if I want to understand people who came into the store, I can't just look at, for instance, the mall foyer and say, did they go right? Did they go left? Or did they go center? The reason for that is a lot of people walking through that area didn't just enter the store, right? These are major pathways to the store. People are crossing, they're going in, and they're exiting. Every entrance in the store is also an exit in the store. And unlike a website where anybody can exit from any given point, nobody walks back out to the homepage to exit. Actually, people do that sometimes, but you don't have to do that. In a store, you do. So the pathways are always complicated because there's always the entry pathways and the exit pathways. So to get around that, what I I did was I started with mall entry as my as my main entry point for the path. Then I looked at mall foyer. This forces me basically be looking at people with no previous touches who looked at mall entry and then went to mall foyer. And then I can see the path of people and where they went. So right here, that's pretty much my answer to the question. Um, you know, these are these are kind of obscured here. The, the nomenclature basically is, you know, just alphabetical. But basically, this is telling me that 62% of the people broke into the G1 area out of this and 21% went down walk to and then a little smattering went down in the other direction. Now, if I want, I can extend this. And if I can find my mouse, there we go. I'm just going to let this roll for a little bit. I have the ability to break out that all other, so I can actually see that no, I didn't want to do that. Ah, hold on, let me re-click. And that's the problem with having to drive around a video. Um, I, I can actually break that out and see in more detail all the routes that somebody came in. And that's pretty much the answer to my question. I'm really quickly going to go through the second part of this because I then went and did exactly the same thing again, looking at the main entry, not the mall entry. So um, I went over and I switched my path and I'm just going to roll ahead here and do the same thing on main entry to main foyer. And now I can see that this, and I'm going to pause this here, um, this breaks out a lot more evenly. You can see from the mall perspective, almost everybody went in one direction when they entered from the mall. But when they're coming in from the main entry, it breaks out on a much more equitable basis between people who are going to the center of the store, the right of the store, and the left of the store. So pretty big differences between the way people behave between the two entrances. And that's the answer to that particular question. All right, I wanna show you one more example of this. And this is another question that we get asked a lot. And this is, hey, are there dead spots in the store? You know, from a merchandising perspective, um, when I think about a store, I'm often really interested in knowing, hey, where do people go and where they don't? And I'm setting the physical configuration of the store. And I know that physical configuration really matters in terms of the way people navigate the store. But as a merchandiser, I may be setting up displays and merchandising in angles, facing people or away from where people are actually navigating the store. So this idea of dead spots is super, super important. And what I've done here is I've gone into what we call the grid point view of the store. This is the most finely detailed view of the store. This is a really big store we're looking at here. It's more than 100,000 square foot. But in this view, every little box that I'm looking at is a square foot and a half. So really, really small. And I can see the color-coded foot traffic here, I can see the little hot spots. I can see the way people flow through the store. I can see all the little detail about the way people are navigating. But what I'm going to do here is zoom in. I'm going to look at one particular section to see if I can understand the dead spots on that. I'm going to pause. Oh, no, I didn't want to click. I wanted to pause. Hold on. Let me go right back there and go right here. Okay. Um, all right, so this is a view right within the software. And you know, this isn't like fancy analytics or anything. This is really simple. But as I look at this, I can see that in this section, um, I tend to get a lot of traffic. All these color-coded areas right here, that's where all the traffic is flowing. And oddly enough, and this is really interesting, the traffic flows around the outside. That's pretty natural because that's the entryway from the mall. But it also flows kind of behind the main merchandise here. And then some of it flows 
right through this area here along here, but I can see that there are some significant dead spots and there are displays set up in these areas but they're displays that are capturing a little bit of what people are doing. So um, as I look at this, you know, just visually, I can see the dead spots. And there's a lot of different things that I can do from the perspective of analyzing this data more. So I'm sorry, going on the mouse here. I can take this and switch from visits to time spent. So I've been looking at foot traffic, but now I'm gonna look at where people spent time. And you can see it maps pretty closely. I still have those exact same dead spots for the most part, those haven't changed at all. And I can see where people are spending a lot of time around the displays and where they're not spending much time at all. And I can even see you know, areas on the displays where there tend to be dead spots. So from particular angles of what I'm looking at, I can see if this is the way a display should be tilted and how that should be facing. I'm gonna take another look at this and just show you some other different ways that you can do this. A second way that you can do this is to, to take advantage of the fact that we're measuring the entire shopper journey. And here what I've done is I've segmented on people who actually shopped this section. So I don't wanna look at people who passed by. I don't wanna look at people who just walked through the section because maybe they're giving me a misleading idea of where people shopped. What I wanna do is just focus in on people who actually spent time in the area. So I've done a segmentation and I've segmented on people who spent a significant amount of time in this area. And now I've looked at their navigation pattern in the store. So this is footfall and time spent for people who just spent time and shopped in this area. And you can see that in a lot of ways, the dead spots are pretty similar to what I looked at from the big perspective. So it didn't really fundamentally change, but I think that's a good example of the way you can also use the fact that you've got the full journey to apply segmentations and sort of skin the cat differently. One other aspect of this that I wanted to show is that a lot of times when we find stuff um, about the store, a lot of times there's skepticism. People have never seen these kinds of numbers before. Um, and we built a tool um, called the Full Journey Playback Tool, which is a tool we often use um, after we've done the basic analysis and sometimes to supplement the basic analysis so that people can actually see how these behaviors are playing out. So what this tool allows you to do is actually look at almost on a playback kind of mode, how shoppers are behaving. So what I've done is uh, in the journey playback, I'm gonna play this, each circle here is a shopper. Um, and you can see it's kind of putting these lines on that. I'm gonna turn those off for a, middle, for a little bit. So each circle is a shopper. If you see squares, those are identified associates. That's an associate moving in. So here's the area that I'm looking at. And you can kind of see people move through the area as I play this. So you can see individual shoppers. You can see two shoppers coming into the area now. Notice how they turned a sharp left there went back into that area there, exactly what we were seeing in the data. Um, so from that perspective, you can kind of see the behavior play out. What I'm gonna do now is speed it up in the view and turn the trails on. What this allows me to do is almost like contrails in the sky where I can see where jets are flying. Well, by turning these trails on and making them persistent over time and then speeding up the playback, now what I'm doing is this looks almost like an air traffic control pattern, right? But if you look at the section here, what I'm seeing is exactly the same dead spots. And what we do with this tool is not so much analytic, we use it to show people, to explain how these behaviors are actually playing out. So if they look at the numbers, they're not sure about the numbers, they can go and look at the playback tool and actually get a deeper, better sense about how things actually played out. So that's pretty much it. That's a demo, gives you a little taste about how this stuff actually works and how it, and, and I think from a, a, a digital analytics perspective, that's probably all going to be pretty familiar, but there are some twists. You know, I think the, the ability to map stuff onto a store the degree to which the analytics is very focused on geolocation and the layout of the store and that kind of playback mode, those are things that really don't work so well from a website perspective, but from a store perspective, um, the analytics can actually take advantage of the fact that, they, that the store is a thing with a geophysical presence that people actually have to navigate. So um, I want to wrap up because the goal is to get this in in 30 minutes and I'm just slightly over. I'm at the questions section. Um, my contact information is here. Um, so hopefully, hey, hey guys, uh, please put some questions and uh, some questions in the Q and A section. Um, I will talk to the ones there now. Um, so I'll give you just a second here. I'm going to take a pause, take a drink, look at what the, the three <laughs> questions that are in there, and uh, please add some more. And I'll, I'll I'll get to these in a second. That was uh, that was awesome. Um, the fact that you managed to get through all that and only technically go three minutes early over uh, is uh, is impressive. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to play the, the, the moderator card and, and preempt the questions in the Q and a and ask a question on the, on the cost. And you talk about the expense 
is it one where it's the upfront cost is really high and then the ongoing cost comes way down? Like, is it yeah. the installation? And then once you have the infrastructure in place, is it, is it pretty manageable? Absolutely. That, that's exactly the way it is. I mean, that, that's both frustrating and good, right? I mean, in the sense that virtually all the costs are up front. The hardware is fairly expensive and uh, there really aren't too many models around there that let people you know, lease or rent hardware. We don't do that for our clients and really nobody does that. So in most cases, you are looking at upfront costs to purchase the hardware and installing the hardware in the store often costs about 60 to 70% of the total hardware cost. So it's almost like you know, nearly doubles the cost on an upfront basis. After that, it's very much like digital analytics. The costs are much more manageable. It's just a software service platform. The hardware itself, one good thing I'll say about it is almost all of the hardware is very reliable. It doesn't break down a lot. It doesn't have a lot of maintenance costs that are associated with it. There aren't a lot of extra network costs or extra cloud costs that come with that. So it is, that's exactly right. It's virtually all upfront costs. The upfront costs can be a little painful. And that is the biggest deterrent to things like fleet-wide measurement. When people think about uh, what they're going to measure and how they're going to measure, by far and away, the most common types of configurations that we see from a measurement perspective are people choosing to measure you know, a select group of their sort of core layouts. So if you have, maybe if you have, let's say you have one banner, so you're just one kind of store, but maybe almost everybody has at least two or three, in some cases, four or five different layouts that they support within that core banner. Um, and then you're going to have maybe five, four or five regions that you care about. So typically what people will do is pick two or three stores per region, per banner. That's a complete rollout. So even if they have 400 stores, they may be measuring 30 or 40 of those stores at most, and they would consider that a complete rollout. And what they're doing is measuring in those stores and then taking the learnings from those and applying it across the whole fleet. Uh, we would obviously, hey, as a, as a measurement company, you know, we, we have a self-interest in fleet-wide measurement. Uh, but the truth is that in most cases, it's just not worth it. I mean, we don't even, in, in most cases, we don't even try to sell clients fleet-wide measurement. We just try to sell them on that idea of, you know, putting in enough measurement so that in every region and in every banner and in every core layout in the banner, you have good measurement. Ah, nice. So you want me to feed you the questions or do you want to just scan through? We've got a few flowing in and I think you called it correctly that the privacy was a good privacy. There's a little more to talk about with the privacy there. So maybe let, let me talk through that because I, I didn't talk a lot about the second part of this. How do you stitch this up? I, uh, so I'll just retouch again on the privacy part, which is that uh, I think these technologies tell a really good privacy story. Um, they're not being used for marketing. They're not being used to message people. These aren't third-party cookies. This is like a classic first-party cookie application. You're really using it to improve the store. Um, and it's one of those things where you're even more than first party cookies, you're really collecting zero information about the customer. So um, I think it, from a privacy perspective, I am super comfortable with these technologies. And I think they tell a great story around privacy, better, much better than most people expect. Unfortunately, sometimes that makes the second story a lot worse than people anticipated. Um, at least with camera and LiDAR data, you are collecting no PII whatsoever. Um, what that means is, that in most cases you cannot stitch to any electronic exhaust or any additional customer information. There is one method for tying shopper journey data together with broader information about the shopper. Um, at point of sale, um, if you identify someone at point of sale, like they're part of a loyalty program, if you wish, you can tie that person's shopper trail to their time at point of sale to the transaction at point of sale. In other words, you know, we're tracking people down to like the one inch level with LIDAR, or one foot level, it doesn't matter. When you're in front of a cash wrap, we know exactly that person. You know, we don't know who they are, but we know they're at that cash wrap for a minute and a half. Well, virtually every point of sale system collects the time at register. Most of them collect the start and stop time at register, which means that if you're getting a loyalty identification for that person, you can tie that to the broad shopper journey. Now, from our perspective, we think that requires an opt out, an opt in from the shopper, either in the loyalty program or you know in some way in what you're doing. Um, if you're going to tie those two together and de-anonymize the person, now if you just want to tie it together so that you understand, here's the overall shopper journey and here was their cart. You don't need the opt in. You can actually tie point of sale to shopper journey and you can do that seamlessly. But if you are going to de-anonymize the person, you actually need an opt in for them, and that's the one place that you can actually tie out to the rest of the shopper journey. That, that makes sense. And any, any follow-up around that? 
That I mean, that, that seems to make sense. I guess on the, to Melissa's question where it flips around, it seems like you, in you technically could do the same thing if it was a buy online and then they came and picked up, you'd have the, the key at the, at the pickup. So absolutely. I guess does, does the, uh, that, that is that. absolutely true with BOPUS. Um, you know, if, if you've got a BOPUS station in the store and you want to track, for instance, what else people are doing in the store, that is an opportunity that you would have. Yep. Cool. Um, so Mitchell asks that that was a fun demo, but what do you think about the retail apocalypse? Is this helping your business or I guess the business in general? <laughs> no, no. Well, I will say uh, two, two things about that. I mean, obviously uh, change does in some respects help our business. I mean, I think retailers are being forced to revisit what they do and how they do it. There's a lot of pressure on retailers to do things better and differently. Um, and I think from that perspective, um, it does help our business. But on the other hand, as I suspect you guys have seen, um, you know, it's a lot easier to sell stuff to people when their business is doing well, than when their business is going down the drain. And so from that perspective, I, I would say, you know, it's, it's been a, a, a mixed blessing. I mean, I think, you know, most of our clients turn out not to be people who are struggling, but people who are doing well, um, who want to do even better. And I think you probably, I think you saw the same thing in digital analytics, where a lot of times the people who turned out to be best at digital analytics were people who had a pretty good business to begin with, not people whose business was going down the drain because they were under so much competitive pressure. I think we found kind of the same thing to be true in the retail world. It's usually retailers who are actually doing pretty well that are coming to us and are looking to do even better with what they're doing. Uh, that being said, there's no doubt that retail is going through fundamental change right now. Um, and change is great from, from, for driving measurement. I mean, people lose all the certainties that they have from their historical world. You know, they just don't know as much about what's going on. And when they put in new things, there's often a real desire for measurement. So it's certainly been good from that perspective. I will say, you know, COVID was absolutely brutal. Obviously, a lot of our clients just shut down completely. That was not good for our business at all. So in that sense, uh, you know, ch change can be good, but change could suck. Too. <laughs> so I, have, I have mixed feelings on that. One. So that I'm going to leapfrog on the questions a little bit because COVID is, I know stores, there were stores that were reconfigurating, reconfiguring for social distancing. So uh, I asks like on the website, any change can screw tracking, thus analytics. Are there any breaking changes that can happen on the floor that can affect data capture yeah. and analytics? Like basically That's how do you keep the store map up to date? It's a great question. Yeah. This, this, this totally, uh, in one sense, um, the tracking works regardless of how the store is configured, right? We're tracking people. And one of the things you can sort of see is that as you look at the flows, you can kind of see where the, where the displays are and the walls are and things like that. One advantage that we have here, at least with camera technologies, is that while the cameras don't take video, um, the cameras can be set, don't ship video up to the cloud. They can be set up to take a snapshot and send it up to the cloud. We do we, we actually do that once daily. So before the store opens and before there are shoppers on the floor, we take a snapshot and those video those those images all get stored in the cloud and they're used to help us actually configure the digital maps of the store. In most cases, though, clients are actually working to keep the digital map of the store updated because that digital map of the store is a merchandising map. It's not just a physical map. It's what merchandise is there in this location that changes all the time and if you don't keep that map up to date well it's like any other kind of analytics it's garbage in and garbage out if we if you think the genes are there but it's kids but 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 it's you know tennis rackets and kids stuff um well the measurement just sucks because you're looking at something that's different than what you expect it to be so it is really important to keep that digital map up to date it's nice that we have the cameras so we can actually see physical changes in the store but it's really important for the client to be be on top of that and to be constantly updating that digital map with what merchandise is actually there. Funny story on this, you know, one of the first ever experimental programs we did where someone was actually running a test and learn program in a merchandising area. One thing that actually turned out to be very sensitive was that the merchandising test was being run on feature tables and these tables were actually wheeled um, and every day they were getting moved around a little bit, somewhat inadvertently, right? Just in setup, people were moving the tables around and our software was really precisely tuned. We were trying to figure out, you know, exactly which locations of the table merchandise was and what people were looking at and it kept getting messed up and we eventually just had to generalize that and make it so they could detect where the tables were. So we actually do that kind of thing automatically 
quickly now. But yeah, there's a fair amount of stuff in the store that changes. And just like on a website, that can mess up your analytics pretty badly. So there is some maintenance work. There is some oversight work. It's one of the overheads that just comes with trying to get good analytics out of the store. Well, so so what about when there is a deliberate change, the merchandising shifts, is there like that can be a challenge on websites as well of actually kind of logging so that when yeah. you're looking back two or three months, like is there, have you solved the issue of saying, oh, this was the day that we moved, we swapped you know, move men's jeans to, you know, somewhere else? Is that, solved? that well, get... well, we've solved it in one context. So what the tool actually allows you to do is build those digital maps, but those digital maps are dated. So they each represent a specific date range and you can go in at any time and you can change the map. So let's say you made a change a week ago and you forgot to update the software. You can go in, you can update the digital map and you can date it as of, you know, so as of September 1st, this was the way the store was. What's cool about the software is if you run a query over a year's time, you might have changed the store like 15 times over the course of that year, but it automatically, as it runs the query, applies the correct digital map for every part of the day. That's really important. So yeah, no, it's I, I wouldn't say we've solved this problem because it's just hard. It's hard to keep track of. It's like it's like managing campaigns in the digital world, right? Where you know if a client has thousands of campaigns, a lot of times you just can't keep track of them all, or sometimes they don't always tell you about stuff. There's exactly the same kind of issues, but at least from a platform perspective, it tracks those changes historically. It applies the correct history anytime you run a query, and it allows you to go back and change those things over time. So yeah, it, it actually works pretty well from that perspective. And it is one of those environments where stores are, you know, not only are stores dynamic, but hopefully the whole point of measurement is to make them even more dynamic. So you're actually creating more problems for yourself that you better be able to solve. <laughs> Awesome. So we're at time, but I am going to go with a little bit over and ask like a final question because I think Jean-Francois's question of what's the most interesting types of insights you could provide to a client so far seems like a great, great way to kind of wrap up. Yeah, I'll talk to two things, I guess, around that. Uh, one part of this that really surprised me uh, when I was uh, when we first started doing this was how much interest there was in associates and labor. And I touched on this when I was talking a little bit in the presentation, but uh, associates and labor are just super important and they're people you're tracking them. You're, you're tracking people just like you're tracking choppers. These technologies allow you to track associates in huge detail. One of the most interesting and impactful analysis that we do routinely is that intraday shopper to associate ratio by section, because historically what people have understood is, Hey, I had, you know, 14 associates and I had 600 shoppers come in the store. That's it. That's all I know. I don't know when the shoppers came in. I don't know how, I don't know which sections they went to. I didn't know how many associates I had in those sections. When you track shopper to associate ratios on an intraday basis inside each section, you almost always find places where you're either overstaffed or understaffed to a significant degree at specific times of day and days a week. It's a really impactful, powerful analysis because it results in immediate ROI for the client and it's pretty easy to do. So I think that's one place around that, that I think there's just immediate returns that, that in some ways surprised me. And coming out of the digital world, we tend not to think about you know, the operational associates, people side of the business but it turns out to be really, really important from a measurement perspective. The other thing that I just think there's, it, it's, it's so core to what the store is, but this merchandising analytics, the ability to run test and learn programs around specific displays. So when you change merchandising, when you change a display, uh, did you actually change the pattern of the way shoppers went through stuff? You know, are, are shoppers spending more time? Are they stopping more? Are you catching more eyeballs? Are those eyeballs actually changing direction? Are they engaging more with the merchandise behind? And is that resulting in purchase? And you can measure all of those things, but just that, that tweaking and experimentation and merchandising and display, I think that's just fundamental to what the store does. It may not sound that sexy, but it's really fascinating. And there's unending op op opportunities, I think, for optimization there because display is so rich. There's so many different kinds of display. There's so many choices you can make about you know, colors and products and layout and spacing and angles. You know, one, one change we did in the, in the displays that I thought was fascinating was just changing the angle of tables and, and that actually had a pretty significant impact on the way people flowed through a space because you're guided by the angles of the table. And what we learned was just shifting angles. We can control the way people move through the space. That's the kind of thing that's really hard to do on a website sometimes to get that level of control over navigation. But in a store, you can do really surprising things with that. And I thought that was fascinating. Awesome. Well, that was a fascinating and very quick uh, intense uh, overview you provided. So 
thanks Gary for taking the time and thanks everyone for attending and hopefully we'll see everyone back on future STEC sessions. My pleasure. Thanks everybody.